Aristotle once said that gold was water solidified in the ground and mixed with the sun's rays. Others were sure that gold was made with the help of the philosopher's stone. When the ancient Incas first saw gold, they decided that this metal, falling from the sky, was the tears of a mythical creature. But its real origin seems much more epic. Let's go to a very distant past, to the time when there were no people or animals, to the time when dinosaurs didn't exist yet, to the era when the simplest forms of life were just being formed. Our planet resembled a huge cauldron of chemical elements. There were erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and lightning flashes all the time. It was about 3.9 billion years ago. During this period, huge asteroids flew through our solar system. They fell on Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's possible that asteroids also fell on the Moon and left large craters on it. There was a real apocalypse on our planet. But fortunately, no one felt it because there was no life yet. Along with the destruction, the asteroids brought metals. But were there metals on Earth before that? Of course! The core of our planet is mainly made up of metals such as iron. From there, it spreads to Earth's crust, mixes with magma, comes into contact with oxygen, and combines with other elements. But how did they get into the core? Simple hydrogen and helium atoms merged and formed heavier elements inside giant stars. Then, supernovae exploded and formed big clouds of dust and gas. These clouds reached our galaxy and began to revolve around the sun. Over time, this dust and the remnants of stars formed planets. One of them was our Earth. Metals lying in the bowels of our planet are difficult to get. And we wouldn't have the technology we have now if it wasn't for that meteor shower that left metals on Earth's surface. There are two theories. The first suggests that powerful supernova explosions far from our universe formed a lot of metals from the periodic table. During the explosion, nuclear fusion started and it created atoms of gold. Then the blast wave threw those hot pieces in different directions. They flew for a long time, cooled down in cold space, and reached our solar system. Another theory says that gold and other metals appeared because of the merger of two neutron stars. These are powerful giant stars that are many times smaller in size than the Sun, but several times heavier than it. These are objects with tremendous gravitational force and density. Their collision formed an intense gamma-ray burst of radiation that could synthesize gold. In 2017, astrophysicists observed the collision of two neutron stars for the first time. They found traces of heavy metals, including gold, using gravitational wave detectors. So this theory seems more likely. And what if we go even further? Where did stars come from? Clouds of dust and gas are scattered throughout the universe. They mix, combine into one mass, and grow like a snowball. They squeeze each other and form a gravitational force. When all the material collapses, it starts to heat up. And then, this surge of energy creates a star. Some physicists assume that stars, during their lifetime, can produce most of the elements of the periodic table. If this theory is true, then our body also consists of stars. We may be part of some gigantic supernova that exploded billions of years ago at the other end of the universe. More than 50 years have passed since the appearance of this theory, but no one has proved or disproved it. Okay, let's get back to gold. One of the largest gold deposits in the world is in southern Africa. Scientists believe that the precious metal appeared there more than 2 billion years ago after the fall of a giant meteorite. People are sure that gold is hidden in the world's oceans. Anywhere from 10 to 20 million tons of this precious metal can be underwater. But those are not large stones, but tiny particles dissolved in liquid. The extraction of such gold is too expensive. Now, let's find out how people mine gold and turn it into jewelry. At first, 
people find gold deposits, large plots of land or rock inside which gold is hidden. Workers begin to use picks, shovels, and machines to extract shiny pieces from the rock. Then these pieces are dissolved in a special acid that separates the gold from the solids. After that, other substances get removed from the precious metal by melting or using gaseous flora. When the gold is purified, it's checked for purity. 99.9% .9 is the benchmark. Done! Your gold is ready to use. You can turn it into jewelry or part of an electronic device. The rarest metals on Earth also got here from stars. I'm talking about rhodium and iridium. They are several times more expensive than gold, not because of their beauty, but because of their practical value. For example, rhodium and iridium can turn harmful gases into harmless ones, and 90% of the demand for this metal falls on the automaker's market. People use these metals in the manufacturing of auto catalysts. They are needed to clean harmful exhaust. When toxic substances produced during fuel combustion come into contact with these precious metals, they become their safer forms. A micro layer of rhodium and iridium is applied to the walls of the catalyst cylinder. Gold, platinum, rhodium, and iridium are the most expensive metals. But what about the most durable ones? It's a little complicated to determine one winner because the strength of a metal depends on four criteria. First, there's tensile strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist tearing. For example, modeling clay has a low tensile strength because you can easily stretch it in different directions. Among metals, tungsten is perhaps the most difficult to stretch. Another criterion is compressive strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist compression. And here, chrome is one of the strongest. The third criterion for the strength of metals is yield strength. To test this, you need to make a rod or beam from any metal and then try to bend it and break it. The metal that shows the greatest resistance has a high yield strength level. And titanium is pretty good for that. And the fourth criterion is impact strength. This shows how strong the metal is when it gets dropped or hit. In this regard, iron shows a good result. Each metal has its own strong and weak sides. Chrome, for example, has a high resistance to compression, but it's weak if you try to stretch it. Therefore, people make metal alloys to combine their strengths. Okay, we've learned about the rarest and most expensive metals. And what about other elements? What's the rarest substance in the world? Meet astatine, the rarest element on the planet. There are about 0.8 ounces of this substance found in the whole world. The rate of its decay is equal to the speed of its formation. Therefore, the amount of the substance in nature doesn't change. People discussed it in the 1800s and discovered it at the end of the 19th century. But even now, after so many years, we know little about this element. In 1869, the creator of the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev, learned that there was a certain substance numbered 85 in the group of halogen elements. This group of non-metals includes such substances as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So astatine is considered the heaviest of all known halogens and most similar to metals. It has a low melting point and conducts heat and electricity poorly. It's brittle in solid form and has a dark color. Even today, scientists don't know all its properties. It's almost impossible to find it in nature, but chemists have learned to synthesize it artificially. People don't know how to use this element because it's too radioactive. But in some laboratories, scientists conduct experiments using astacine to treat thyroid diseases. It's raining cats and dogs, literally. Things falling down from the sky can be pretty unexpected. So here are some examples. Residents of Texarkana, Texas once had light rain and fish shower. No need to go fishing out in the sea. The fish literally falls down on your head. In fact, animal rains are not uncommon. Water spouts or updrafts occurring in different corners of the earth sometimes carry small creatures up with them. Those could be crabs, frogs, or indeed, fish. 
A water spout is generally a whirlwind that picks up water and grows in size until it connects the surface of the water and the clouds. Lightweight critters living close to the water surface often get caught in the vortex and carried up and away. Thunderstorm clouds are constant companions of water spouts too. When the storm reaches a landmass, it starts slowing down, having nowhere to take the new energy from. It slowly subsides, the atmospheric pressure drops, and the thunderclouds release the water in them, along with the unfortunate small animals and fish. Sometimes, it's just a few frogs frozen from the cold up above, but at other times, it could be hundreds or thousands of creatures raining down upon the land. A much more unusual rain once happened in Oakville, Washington, and it's still waiting for someone to explain it. The rain clouds looked perfectly normal, but the rain they released was anything but. Translucent jelly-like blobs fell on the town, covering a total area of about 20 square miles. Each of them wasn't larger than a grain of rice. Researchers who studied these raindrops claimed that the gooey blobs contained human white blood cells. Some believe they might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain or waste from a commercial airplane. Now this kind of rain is what I'd like to see someday, a money shower. One such event occurred in a small town in Germany. A woman was driving when she suddenly saw banknotes swirling down from the sky, so she hit the brakes. She went out of her car and later said she managed to collect quite a large amount of money. After which, as any responsible citizen should, she turned it over to the police. Strangely, when the officers came back to the scene with the woman, they couldn't find any more cash, although she claimed she hadn't been able to collect everything. There's still no explanation for the event, but certainly, no water spout could have caused that. A pretty unpleasant kind of rain happened back in 1876 in Olympia Springs, Kentucky. It was a very local kind, too. Mrs. Crouch said that she had been making soap outside her home when pieces of raw meat suddenly started falling down from the sky around her. Some of those chunks were pretty massive, reaching over three inches in diameter. Local newspapers reported that two people who decided to remain unknown tasted the meat and concluded it was mutton or venison. Months later, scientists decided to find out the truth behind the strange event. It became a matter of heated debate until one of the researchers came up with the most reasonable conclusion. The meat rain must have been caused by vultures flying over the town at the time. These birds sometimes regurgitate food right in the middle of their flight as a defense mechanism, or to make their bodies lighter to fly faster. And that must have been what happened right over Mrs. Crouch's house, unfortunately. Something totally inedible, but no less sinister, rained down on several villages in India in the middle of May of 2022. Huge black and silver metal balls started dropping from the sky, the first one weighing over 15 pounds. Astounded residents watched in shock as it hammered the ground, scattering pieces of itself across the nearby fields. Similar balls later fell in the other two neighboring villages. Luckily, no one was harmed during the strange metal rain. But the issue remained. We're on Earth, and it usually rains water here. The local authorities weren't sure what it was about, but astronomers soon voiced a theory that it could be debris from a space rocket. One that fits the description had launched in September of 2021, aiming to put a communication satellite into orbit. Upon its re-entry into the atmosphere, it might have been damaged, causing several chunks of it to detach and fall down on the ground in India. Sometimes it rains birds, too. One such event occurred in Arkansas in 2010. Weather conditions might cause things like that to happen, but there are simpler reasons, too. Loud noise and confusion, or even collisions with aircraft. In the case of Arkansas, it was the noise and flashing lights from the New Year's Eve fireworks. The show startled thousands of birds and made them start into the air. They were panicking and disoriented, so they collided with buildings, cars, and trees. Many of them eventually fell to the ground, making lots of people believe it was actually raining birds. Now, if anything could startle me out in the sky, it's a rain of spiders. And if you wonder whether it's a real thing, well, yes, it is. In Australia, spider rains actually happen quite often. They even have a name for this, ballooning. 
It goes like this. Spiders that can balloon climb up trees and tall bushes, trying to reach the highest point available in the area. When they've climbed up to the very top, they spin their web in such a way that it allows them to be carried by the wind. And there it goes, clutching the strands of the web with its tiny little feet. The brave spider lifts off into the air and flies to whatever awaits it out there. Normally, ballooning goes unnoticed by us humans because spiders don't travel in large groups. You might have a shocking experience when a spider suddenly lands on your face out of nowhere, but otherwise, it's a rare occasion to meet more than two ballooners at once. Still, when the weather gets particularly bad, with lots of rain or wind, thousands or even millions of spiders might decide it's time to move to somewhere friendlier and take to the sky all at once. That's when spider rains occur. Those who witnessed the most recent ones back in 2012 and 2015 say it looks like a snowfall. Spiders slowly drifting down on their web parachutes that settle on the ground and turn it white. Remember water spouts? Well, those things can lift not only fish and frogs into the sky and make a spectacular show of them falling back on the ground. Golf balls sometimes become their cargo too. And I'm not speaking of golf ball sized hail, but actual balls. The town of Punta Gorda in Florida witnessed a rain of golf balls in 1969. Newspapers reported dozens upon dozens of those things pummeling the ground and buildings for a short while. Since it's a coastal town with lots of golf courses, it wasn't hard to explain the event. A water spout must have formed near the shore, traveled to some course, grabbed a few dozen golf balls, and then released them over the town. Rain can be pretty refreshing, as long as it's not mud rain. On April 12, 1902, the town of Easton, Philadelphia experienced an unusual shower. It made all those unfortunate enough to go outside take an actual shower and wash their clothes to boot. The raindrops looked dirty to the eye, and they were. People, buildings, and streets looked really wanting to take a good bath after it stopped pouring. The witnesses reported a considerable amount of dust in the air before the rain started, which probably explains the event. In 2011, a town in Scotland saw another weird rain variety. It was showered with worms. The rain didn't cover a large area. It seems only some local academy students were unlucky enough to get invertebrates falling on their heads while playing soccer. There was a significant change in the weather at the time, so scientists believe it might have resulted from some meteorological anomaly. They say this place is swarming with money. It's been stored there for centuries, but no one managed to take it away from this island. Treasure hunters have been bewitched with this place since 1795. Many people have tried their luck looking for the treasure that could be hidden there by the Spanish pirates or even by the Knights Templar. But today, it's impossible to get there, as it's a private place. So all you can do is book an ocean tour around this island. Otherwise, you can take a peek at it in a TV reality show starring the Legina brothers, Rick and Marty, who are a team of enthusiasts looking for the treasures of Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. Yeah, seems like there's no place where TV producers can't get to. One of the most famous discoveries out there was the so-called Money Pit. Despite the promising name, it wasn't full of money. Now we have to jump to 200 years ago. The money pit was first found by a 16-year-old kid in 1795. One day, Daniel McGuinness went fishing at Oak Island. He saw a tree there. Unsurprisingly, it was an oak, and it had weird markings. They didn't seem to be natural, so Daniel decided to check the area. He then saw a sunken patch of ground and started digging immediately. His two friends helped him out, but instead of treasures, the guys only found logs placed underground at regular intervals. It looked like a place where someone could hide money or jewels, but nothing precious was found. However, there was something curious down that pit. Someone found a granite stone there, and it had an engraved inscription on it. There were many attempts to decode it, but most of them ended up in failure. There's one translation though, and it says, 40 feet below. Two million pounds are buried. Yeah, McGinnis and his friends should have dug harder. The next fun thing about the money pit 
is the coconut fiber found down there. They say that large amounts of this fiber were found at a depth of 60 feet. It may not surprise you, but I have to remind you of one thing. Oak Island is in Nova Scotia, Canada. Coconut trees do not grow there. The nearest one is about 1,500 miles from Nova Scotia, which makes it obvious that someone brought this fiber purposefully. Researchers came up with an idea that coconut fiber could have been used to make ropes and lower all the treasures down the pit. Next up, we have not one, but two mysteries. In the late 1800s, the Oak Island Treasure Company was thoroughly inspecting and excavating the island. Everyone believed something enormous was hidden there. These guys managed to drill 153 feet underground. That's like 15 stop signs stacked one on top of the other. You might have guessed that they didn't find pounds of gold and diamonds, but they found a manuscript. There's a theory claiming that it's one of Shakespeare's lost manuscripts. Some scientists believe that it was hidden there by the writer and scientist Francis Bacon, the true author of Shakespeare's works. Yeah, rumor has it it was Francis and not William who wrote all the plays and sonnets. But there's no proof it was really so. The Money Pit may be the most popular shaft on Oak Island, but it's not the only one and it's not the first. Before the Money Pit discovery, treasure hunters were drilling at Smith's Cove. While damming there, they found a wooden piece. It was a U-shaped formation that had Roman numerals. After a more thorough inspection, the specialists realized it was supposedly dated to 1769. The money pit was discovered 26 years later. This fact created many speculations that this structure might have been part of the real shaft with treasures everyone was looking for. Now, look at this Templar coin. It wasn't the first discovery on the island, but it was crucial in some way. Even if it may not sound like a big deal today, in medieval times, those coins would amass an insane amount of wealth. They were typically stored in European fortresses. For the treasure hunters, this coin was a sure sign there was more to be found on the island. The logic is simple. If there's one coin of that kind, there must be something else. And they were right. It wasn't the only Templar discovery. On the southwest shore of the island, a crossbow bolt was found. Experts say it dates back to the 13th century. But once again, that wasn't something the treasure hunters were after. Some more coins were found on the island. Rick and Marty Legina retrieved this precious piece from a swamp. The coin is made of copper, and this time, it originated from Spain. When it was found, the Legina brothers could only see the number 8 engraved on it. But later on, some experts studied this coin and claimed it was made sometime around the 17th century. They managed to clean it well and saw the date 1652 engraved on the back of this coin. There's a theory stating that Spanish explorers found some treasure but hid it instead of taking it to the king. So maybe this coin just dropped out of the chest full of coins and jewels and is part of the treasure everyone was after. Or someone could have accidentally lost it while looking for the treasure. Who knows? One more famous treasure hunter is Gary Drayton. Gary and his team, together with Rick Legina, came across two coins while metal detecting the island. Those were 17th century King Charles II Britannia coins. One of them had a very clear inscription on it, stating that the coin was minted back in 1771. Another swamp treasure of possibly Spanish origin is also here. This time, it's a silver ring. A specialist studied it closely and reported that it had been repaired twice. The ring was once made bigger, and it was also made smaller once. It's decorated with a floral design, which was popular in Europe in the 1730s. Among all the other curious things, Rick and Marty Legina found a silver button at Isaac Point. The button's pretty old. It supposedly dates back to the middle of the 18th century, and the notorious money pit was discovered later. This is why it wasn't a big deal of a find. It could simply belong to some farmer peacefully raising livestock on the island. There's no official record of any chest full of gems and coins found on Oak Island, but enthusiasts did find some jewels there. First off, the team found a brooch with a magnificent red gem. They mistakenly thought it was a ruby, but a professional gemologist stated it was a garnet. 
the piece was made of silver, and it's pretty old. Experts believe it was made around the 15 or 1600s. Another brooch they found didn't have any gems on it, but it had an intricate design. It's a brooch with a leaf design and an ornate rope. There are 13 branches of the leaf, which instantly created more mystery to the whole treasure hunting. First off, there's a carving with a 13-branched tree on a rock on the north shore of this island. What's more, many people believe that the number 13 is important to the Knights Templar. The enthusiasts also found a brooch not far away from the place where Daniel McGuinness, the guy who found the money pit, lived. The brooch was shown to a professional gemologist, Charles Luton Brain. He had to break it to the team that there were no gems adorning this piece of jewelry. In fact, the stone that seemed to be a gem was just a piece of glass. It was processed using a special technique, though, so it was leaded glass. The enthusiasts decided to study the brooch even more and found out that part of the brooch was made of gold. The specialists claim that the brooch dates back to the 14th century. Was it the treasure everyone was looking for?